Good morning and a very warm welcome to Shettleston News online service on Sunday the 7th of February. A warm welcome also if you're listening in on the phone via our relaunched dial a sermon service. This is now being provided by Greyfriars Church in Lanark and can be accessed by dialing the phone number on screen. Before we begin, I've got a message from Anne Kirkwood, who would like to thank everyone for their support and kindness following her mother's passing. I think she's been quite overwhelmed by all the expressions of sympathy. So please continue to keep Anne and Billy in your prayers at the moment. Psalm 100 encourages us to worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. So we're going to do that in just a moment. But first, let's take a minute to be still and to focus all our attention on him before we sing, Come People of the Risen King, who delight to bring him praise. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we come to you this morning because we do indeed delight to bring you praise, rejoicing in who you are and what you have done for us in Christ. 
redeeming a sinful people to be your own prized possession, your precious sons and daughters. We thank you that there is room in your family for all of us, for those who are rejoicing and those who are weeping, those who have walked with you for years and those who are new to the faith. Help us to bless you with our worship as we sing your praises, bring you our prayers and listen to your words spoken to us. May your spirit inspire us in all of this, that we may indeed worship you in spirit and in truth and be transformed into an ever closer likeness to your son. We seek to follow his example just now as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Last week, we saw Jesus doing something that seemed quite surprising on the face of it. He'd been preaching in the fishing village of Capernaum and had performed many miracles there. In the space of one day and one night, he'd attracted a huge crowd filled with eager expectation to see what he would do next. But Jesus disappoints this crowd as he slips away early the next morning and goes to other villages to preach his message about the coming kingdom of God and the need to repent and to believe. And we talked last week about the priority that Jesus assigned to preaching this message. Now this week, We've got a short reading, mainly just describing Jesus' encounter with one person. But if we listen carefully, we'll find that there are several surprises that occur during this conversation as well. And Joyce is going to read it to us just now. Mark chapter 1 verses 40 to 45. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, He went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Amen. The first surprise is the word used to describe what takes place here. The man with leprosy doesn't ask Jesus to heal him of this disease. Instead, he talks about being cleansed. And there's no mention of healing in the rest of this passage either. The word cleansed is used throughout, which seems odd to us, doesn't it? Why does Mark use cleansed here when a few verses earlier he's talked about Jesus healing many people in Capernaum? Well, the answer is that leprosy was a disease that didn't simply have physical effects on people. It also had a profound social impact. You were declared unclean and were cut off from the rest of society. Now physical effects are horrific enough. Nerve endings near the surface of the skin are damaged, leading to discoloration and a loss of sensation. With time, the nerve damage progresses to the end of your limbs, meaning that you can damage your hands and your feet and just keep on injuring them because you're unaware of the damage you're doing, often leading to ulcers, infection, or the loss of fingers and toes. Muscle paralysis can also occur, 
making everyday actions like walking difficult. And it can also affect the eyelids, preventing blinking and then leading to eye damage or blindness. There are some of the physical symptoms, but the effect on your mental well-being must also have been devastating. Leviticus chapter 13 indicates the regulations for dealing with skin diseases like leprosy when the Israelites were in the desert and then after they'd entered the promised land. But although the context here is skin diseases rather than respiratory ones, a lot of what's discussed in Leviticus 13 will actually sound very familiar to us. If someone is suspected of being infected, there are periods of isolation of seven days or in some cases 14 days to see if symptoms develop further. There is also a lot of testing, albeit an examination by a priest rather than a swab test administered by a medic. And for those definitely infected, they have to remain outside the Israelite camp, cut off from all contact. Chapter 14 gives requirements for those who appear to have been healed of their infection. And this includes the permission to re-enter the Israelite camp, although they cannot rejoin their family in their tent for another seven days. They have to wait in the camp, but outside their tent. Sort of like an extended garden visit in our terms. So our current predicament perhaps gives us a little bit more insight into what things might have been like, might have been like back then in terms of the isolation, the inability to draw close to or touch your loved ones. But one of the major differences is, I think, the absence of hope. We have hope that our isolated existence will come to an end in the future. For those suffering from full-blown leprosy, there was no hope of a cure aside from a miracle. The isolation would remain for the rest of their lives. To try to give us a wee bit more insight, I'm going to play a short clip from the 1959 movie Ben-Hur. Charlton Heston plays Judah Ben-Hur, a first century Jewish prince who has returned from exile, but is told by his friend Esther that his mother, Miriam, and also his sister have both died. But then he hears from someone else that actually they are alive, but now suffer from leprosy and are living in a colony with other leprosy sufferers, the so-called Valley of the Lepers. So he goes there to find them. But shortly after arriving, he discovers that Esther has come there also to bring food supplies to his mother and sister. And so Judah confronts Esther about lying to him. Why did you tell me they were dead? It was what they wanted. Judah, you must not betray this faith. Will you do this for them? Not to see them. They are coming. Judah, Judah, love them in the way they must need to be loved. Not to look at them. Judah, let it be as if you had never come here. Please, Judah!
Is Judah well? Is he happy? Yes. He is well. Your mind can be at rest for him. He is well, Miriam. God be with you. Miriam doesn't want her son to know that she's alive but suffering from leprosy. Partly because she doesn't want him to see her in her disfigured state. Partly, I think, for fear that Judah might catch the disease if he comes too close. But also because of the stigma that surrounded the disease. Those with leprosy were shunned by others in the ancient world. They had to go about dressed as if they were in mourning and call out unclean, unclean, whenever they approached anyone else. They were supposed to stay at least 50 paces away. They were totally excluded from society, including from worshipping God at the temple in Jerusalem. And so this man comes to Jesus, not simply wanting to be physically healed, he wants to have his place in society restored, to be able to go and hug his family, share a meal with his friends and go to Jerusalem to join in the, the great festivals of worship there. He needs more than healing. He needs the cleansing that will restore his place in the community. But he is also very aware of the attitude of many people, especially the religious elites towards leprosy sufferers. Often it was assumed that leprosy sufferers were being punished for their sin and had been abandoned by God. This man has heard the tales of all the other people that Jesus has healed. And so he has faith in his ability to heal, but he isn't sure whether Jesus will be just like all the other religious leaders and send him packing with condemnation ringing in his ears. And I think this explains why the man doesn't dare directly ask Jesus for help. He just says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. But Jesus' reaction is our next surprise. Verse 41 tells us that Jesus was indignant not the reaction we would expect Jesus to give to this man. But if Jesus was indignant, I don't think he was angry at the man for approaching him. I think he was angry at what this disease had done to him, physically and emotionally. And when we look at what COVID-19 has done to people, isolating them from their friends and family when they are at their most vulnerable, and even stopping people from grieving for loved ones in the way that they would want to. Many of us can relate to that feeling of being very angry at a disease. This is not how life should be. This is not how God had originally intended life to be before sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden. And in the case of this man, Jesus may also have felt angry at the way other people had condemned him causing him to approach Jesus in this sort of roundabout way. But you'll have noticed that I said, if Jesus was indignant, because your Bible translation may well say something like, Jesus was moved by compassion, which is very different from being indignant and perhaps more like the, the reaction we would initially expect from Jesus. The challenge for Bible translators here is that archaeologists have, uncom have uncovered some very early manuscripts that use a Greek word that means angry or indignant. And some, also some other manuscript, manuscripts that have the word for being 
moved by compassion. So which is the correct one? Well, I don't know. Maybe Jesus felt both emotions at once. In any event, he reached out his hand and touched this man. We don't know if there were any onlookers when Jesus met this man, but if there were, they would have been totally shocked by his action. Partly because they would have thought Jesus was risking being in infected himself. And partly because this action would have rendered Jesus ceremonially unclean. Now, Jesus didn't have to touch the man to heal him. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus just has to say the word for someone to be healed, sometimes from many miles away. But Jesus chose to do it to make a point, possibly to any observers, but definitely to the man himself. He probably hadn't experienced the touch of another human being for many years. Some of you might remember back to the 1980s when HIV first appeared and was causing terror as well as much stigma. Princess Diana was due to be visiting a, a, hospital, unit, a hospital unit dedicated to treating people with HIV. And there was much speculation in the media. Would she wear gloves as part of her outfit when greeting the patients there? Now, of course, she didn't. She just shook the hands of the patients normally her skin touching theirs. She was trying to make the point that the patients were human beings too, and also that you couldn't catch AIDS from a handshake. Jesus was wanting to show this man that he wasn't outside of God's love, that God wasn't keeping him at a distance, but wanted to draw close to him. And so Jesus reaches out and touches him, cleansing him from his leprosy. But to be restored back into society, the man needs official recognition of the fact that he has been cleansed. And so Jesus tells him to go to the priest and to follow the instructions in Leviticus 14 about sacrificing offerings to God as part of being pronounced ritually clean. But the other instruction that Jesus gives is our third surprise for today. He says, see that you don't tell this to anyone. On the face of it, it seems bizarre. Why wouldn't Jesus want this man to tell his story, to give his testimony about how Jesus had healed him of an incurable disease? Surely that would encourage other people to come to Jesus. After all, if something like that happened at church today, we'd be delighted if the person who'd been healed was happy to post their story on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat and every other platform we could access in order to share their testimony, hoping it would encourage others to come along. But Jesus has seen what has happened in Capernaum when word gets out about the people he has healed. Huge crowds come flocking to Jesus. But we know from elsewhere in the Gospels that often these crowds just come along looking for miraculous signs, almost like a magic show. They haven't come to listen to a sermon about the kingdom of God. And the size of these crowds makes it very difficult for Jesus to talk to anyone who does want to hear the message. But although, as we said last week, Jesus' priority is to preach his message around Galilee, he still feels love and compassion for this man. He's not going to turn him away. And so he goes ahead and he cleanses the man, hoping the stern warning that he gives him will stop him from spreading the news. But as it turns out, it is a vain hope. The man ignores Jesus and just tells everyone what's happened. And so Jesus has to try to keep a, a low profile to avoid the crowds. In a sense, Jesus and this man have now swapped places. The man is suddenly at the centre of society once again, probably something of a local celebrity, the person whom everyone wants to meet. While Jesus is now the one out in the lonely places. And there's a spiritual parable in there. 
Jesus also changes places with us, cleansing us from our sin and taking our place, the place we deserve as sinners, upon the cross. And I do want to make a, a quick point here about cleansing versus healing. It is clear from our reading that Jesus took away the leprosy that was affecting this man. What we don't know is what damage this leprosy had already done to the man. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes leprosy can cause the loss of fingers or toes or worse. And we're not explicitly told that Jesus healed any such damage, merely that the leprosy left the man and he was cleansed. And I'm highlighting that because sometimes we go to Jesus with our prayers for healing. And they are not answered in the way that we are hoping. I've mentioned before that in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about having a thorn in the flesh. And for reasons I'm not going to get into just now, many theologians think that this thorn in the flesh may have been some form of eye disease. Anyway, Paul says that he, he prayed to God three times, asking him to remove this thorn in the flesh. But instead, he received the answer. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes, like Paul, we may not receive the healing we are hoping for, at least in this world. And instead, we will receive God's grace to carry on in difficult circumstances. But Jesus does cleanse everyone who turns to him in repentance and faith. He cleanses us from sin thanks to his blood shed for us upon the cross. The Apostle John put it like this in his first letter. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed by guilt, hold on to that promise. Now, I've got one final point, and it relates to what Jesus tells the man about not telling anyone else about him or, or what he's done. Now, just so we're all 100% clear, that was a, a specific instruction to that man at that time. It does not apply to us. Jesus wants us to go out and to be his Holy Spirit empowered witnesses everywhere we go. And as we finish, as we go into the week ahead, I'd like us to think about how we can be witnesses for Jesus and how we can show his love in, in one of two specific ways. Is there someone you know who is weighed down by guilt, almost as if it's killing them off from the inside, deadening their senses or their ability to engage positively with life. It might be someone who doesn't know the Lord, or it might be a Christian who's just forgotten what Christ has done for them. But could you talk to them and tell them that Jesus removes our guilt, he cleanses us from sin if we turn to him in repentance and faith. But make sure the emphasis is on Jesus. Don't fall into the trap of telling them, look, what you've done isn't that bad. Lots of other people have done it. You are a good person, really. That's actually not helping very much. Ultimately, it's about encouraging them to turn to Jesus, not simply giving them a pep talk. That's the first way. The second is this. Is there someone you know who's experiencing the sort of social isolation that this man had experienced. Someone whom you could engage with. Now, I know we're all experiencing isolation as a result of lockdown. But really, who I'm meaning is someone who was quite socially isolated 
even before COVID arrived? Could you take a, a step towards them in a safe and responsible way? Obviously, you can't get physically close at the moment. Please don't use Jesus touching the man with leprosy as an excuse to flout social distancing rules. Modern medical science has shown that actually leprosy is not very contagious, contrary to what most people in the ancient world believed. So Jesus wasn't actually risking spreading a contagious disease to other people by his actions. COVID-19 is, of course, very different. So it may be a case of reaching out by telephone or email or, or a chat at a distance outdoors. But is there someone you could reach out to socially and provide some meaningful human contact to? Anyway, I'll leave you to ponder those two points as we turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus. We thank you for what this passage shows us about your love and compassion, your desire to reach out to people, to bring cleansing and restoration and inclusion. Fill us with the same desire, we pray, that we might show your love to others, helping them to turn to you in repentance and faith and be cleansed from sin. Help us to reach out to those who are isolated, that they may experience greater connection with you and with us. Guide us by your Spirit in the days and the weeks ahead as we seek to do this. And help your church around the world to proclaim your message about the kingdom of God and about how we can be part of that kingdom through faith in you. Help us to deepen our relationship with you so that we might be more effective in that witness. Compassionate Saviour, we pray for those who are afflicted by illness. We pray for healing and we pray for grace. We remember especially those who continue to suffer from leprosy today. We thank you for the cures that modern medicine can offer and pray that help reaches those in need. We bring before you all who work in the medical professions, seeking to bring healing to others, often at great emotional cost to themselves. Protect and sustain them, Lord, we pray. We pray for all those who grieve the loss of loved ones, asking you to comfort the broken-hearted Lord. Be with them in all the flood of emotions, we pray. And we remember especially those who've experienced the shock of losing loved ones to violence. Lord, we bring before you all in positions of leadership in these challenging times. Grant them wisdom, we pray. And in a moment of silence, we bring to you anyone who is particularly on our hearts at the moment. Lord, bless those we have named before you and receive our prayers, we pray. Amen. In our passage today, we saw Jesus' love and compassion in action. And we're going to sing of that love just now in our closing hymn, Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
out into the week ahead to show Jesus' compassion to all those who need it. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen.